All right, welcome back, everyone. So as you can see, I'm back from traveling, had a brief vacation. Well, semi-vacation, as you all know, is still broadcasting from on the road. Uh, but good to see you all here again, uh, back at home, got my bookshelf again. And uh, things are interesting in the news still, some big stories to go into. I want to talk about what's happening with the Taliban again, also some what's happening with the new war on terror. And also there seems to be resurgences happening with North Korea as well and also some positioning with the United States and other countries, possibly taking a harder stance against China. Uh, some very interesting developments right now. Uh, a few key points I want to start off with. While well, Biden is defending why he left some Americans in Afghanistan, hundreds of Americans still there, allegedly. And also there's a new war on ISIS, uh, this terrorist organization that's now starting. Uh, we could see, for example, the United States even, even giving some financing to the Taliban, which is a bizarre turning back of time. If you remember that we used to, well, the U.S. used to actually finance and arm the Mujahideen uh, fighting against the Soviets. And there's been a, quite the shift over the years in, on which side these groups are with. But that said, folks, a lot to go into, as always. And as always, it's good to see you all here. Yeah, Pat Owen, you said, hello, Josh. Yeah, th thanks for being here. Uh, Grady Owens, he said, hello from Alabama. Yeah, folks, always great seeing y'all here. Uh, Grace, Grace Ashtay said, hi, Josh and all patriots. Love y'all from Kentucky. Yeah. Hey, hi from Scotland. Susan, Sh uh, Susan uh, Sean Sim, I'm sorry. Thank you for being here. Liz Williams, hello from Texas. Yeah, folks, always a pleasure. Now, uh, that said, briefly, though, I'm going to talk real quick. We do have this new uh, communism series, well, expo exposing the history of communism series, now going live on Epoch TV. The first two episodes are currently available. The third episode's coming out this weekend. And so you've been waiting for it. Sorry for the delay. Uh, the third episode is coming out soon. It's going to be going into the different organizations around the time of the French Revolution and tying, to, tying together a lot of the history leading up to the Paris Commune of 1871, which was technically the first time communism really took power. Uh, a lot of history that nobody knows about, uh, which we're trying to really, I'm, I'm trying to really dig up in this series. Uh, again, three episodes now done, third one coming out this weekend, and more to come soon. Uh, folks, please check it out. That's exclusively on Epoch TV. That's EPOCHTV.com forward slash crossroads. I'll show you a quick trailer of that now. As you can see, we have the... Communism is a belief in the destruction of belief. It destroys religion wherever it goes. So who is the unholy father of communism? Francois Noël Gracchus Baba. The French Revolution would be remembered for its unjust bloodshed, killing over 300,000 people. It was a period known as the Reign of Terror. All right. Yeah, folks, be sure to check that out. That's the Dark Origins of Communism. Three episodes, third one coming up this weekend, and a, a few more to come. And we'll see, we might be expanding that as well into a broader series. I'll keep you updated on that. Uh, but again, that's exclusively on Epoch TV, EPOCHTV.com forward slash Crossroads. And if you want to support Crossroads, that's a great way to do it. Uh, we also have donor box you want to donate, but that's also a great way to do it on Epoch TV. Tell a friend or family member about it. And if you don't have an account yet, all you need for a free trial, if you want to watch this series even, all you need is an email address. So be sure to check it out. The link is in the, in the description below and in the chat. All right, folks, that's, let's jump into the first story for the night. I want to talk about what's happening with, well, Biden defending why he left so many Americans in Afghanistan still. So it says this, Biden defends ending Afghanistan mission as some Americans get left behind. It says President Joe Biden again defended his administration's handling of the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan on August 30th declaring an end to the 20-year-long conflict, but opening up the possibility for future airstrikes against ISIS affiliates in the country, meaning that, yes, America has pulled out of Afghanistan. Yes, we're no longer fighting the Taliban, uh, but we're probably going to keep the war on terror going regardless. Just now we're going to be launching air attacks, very likely, 
against ISIS, this terrorist organization. Remember, several thousand ISIS fighters were let free from the prisons in Afghanistan by the Taliban. And of course, they're the ones that everyone's focused on. Now, it says here, this is Biden talking. He said, this is the way the mission was designed, talking about the rapid withdrawal from the country and the falling of it into kind of chaos. Well, chaos. Biden says, this is the way the mission was designed. He said of the often messy and chaotic evacuation that has drawn criticism from both major political parties, the media, and family members of soldiers who were recently killed in Kabul by terrorists. Although Biden has faced significant criticism, he said the military completed one of the biggest airlifts in history and that no nation has done anything like it in all of history. He added, we will continue to support the Afghan people through diplomacy and engagement. Notably, America is no longer going to have very, very likely not going to have any kind of diplomatic engagement in Afghanistan because we also lost our diplomatic mission there. But he says we're going to be continuing to support the Afghan people through diplomacy and engagement. And Biden also said, I take responsibility. And he's talking about the chaotic evacuation and withdrawal. However, Biden suggested that it wasn't possible to leave in a more orderly manner than what had transpired in Kabul. He said that it was not possible to do it in a more ordered way. I'll get into this a bit more. Now, Biden, who didn't take any questions during the speech, blamed the Afghan military and government for collapsing against the Taliban and for putting, up, putting the security of Americans and Afghans on the ground at risk. The Taliban carried out, carried out an offensive that captured nearly all of Afghanistan in roughly 11 days. Moments later, Biden cast some of the blame on the evacuation and government collapse from on the Trump administration, saying it was then President Donald Trump who had hashed out a deal with the Taliban to pull out of the country by May 1st. Over the past few weeks, Trump, who has repeatedly denounced Biden's pullout strategy, said his withdrawal was conditional. Other Trump-era officials, including former acting Pentagon chief Chris Miller, recently said the United States wasn't going to leave Afghanistan under Trump's deal and would have left a few troops behind. Now, remember that Trump was saying that very likely we would, we would have to engage with the Taliban after the withdrawal. He was talking about this. He also said in one of his speeches that America couldn't just rapidly end the war because doing so would be an insult to the, all the Americans who fought and died in the Afghan war, the Afghan allies we had there who fought and died and well, facing possible execution now, and also our different international allies uh, who fought and died in that war. And he, basically the way the, way the way the U.S. was doing this was helping the uh, Afghan army with airstrikes and other support like this. And the idea was that we'd have to engage very likely with the Taliban in some regards, but make sure that the Afghan government under Karzai and the Afghan military, uh, the one that the U.S. was backing and helped train, stayed and stayed there. That was Trump's strategy. Uh, Trump also criticized Biden's approach by saying that if you did want to pull out, the last people you would pull out would be the military. In other words, you would pull out the civilians first, make sure all the civilians are out, all the translators are out, all the different civilians who are going to fall very likely in, into tyranny of some sort. You make sure every person who needs to get out of the country is at first, then you pull out the military. So that was Trump's response uh, to Biden's criticisms. Now, that said, folks, a lot going on with Afghanistan, and I want to talk a bit more about what's happening with, well, I think the broader issue of how this is going to go going forward. Uh, there's some really terrible videos going around. Uh, it's hard to really understand the to, to really confirm the legitimacy of a lot of them, but they do seem to be pretty legitimate, including allegations of house-to-house -house executions, allegations of Taliban fighters going home to home and killing people who uh, are deemed enemies of the regime. Uh, there are videos, for example, of the Taliban using American helicopters that they had taken because Americans left them behind and hanging enemies of the new system from it by their necks until they were dead. Uh, many things like this taking place as the Taliban was promising in some regards to begin respecting, uh, trying to give the image of some legitimacy as a government and not just a tyrannical terrorist organization. There's going to be a lot to go into with this. First, though, folks, I want to mention, again, we're totally demonetized by YouTube, but luckily we do have sponsors. And tonight's episode is brought to you by American Hartford Gold. 
And with all the turbulence in the economy, the stock market risks of inflation, multi-trillion dollars in spending, and as we've seen now, even the uh, manufacturing shortages happening, you might consider investing in something that tends to be both stable and on the incline. That's gold and silver. American Hartford Gold is one of the highest rated firms in the country with an A-plus rating from the Better Business Bureau. They can have your gold and silver delivered right to your doorstep or into your IRA. To learn more, please check out the link in the description below where American Hartford Gold is providing a free 25-page information guide. And again, even if you just want to learn about investing in gold or silver, check out that guide. It's free, no strings attached. If you call them now, you can get up to $1,500 of free silver on all qualifying first orders. The phone number for that is 877-260-2764, or you can text Joshua to 65532. And on that note too, you just want to know what these look like. This is a silver bar right here, one of the smaller ones. This is one of the smaller gold bars. And this is one of the silver coins, actually. So depending on what you get, that's what you get. So, All right, folks, that said, a lot more to go into with Afghanistan. And so let's talk about just briefly some of the headlines. I won't go too deep into this, but I want to try to tie some of this together and show what's happening right now. Now, first of all, they're saying that hundreds of Americans are still in Afghanistan after the last military flight left. And so basically, remember that there were still troops in Afghanistan. The Biden administration moved 6,000 U.S. troops to help with the evacuations. A lot of civilians were trying to make their way to the airport. There were many reports on the ground, even from Americans who are still there, uh, locked in their hotel rooms, locked in their homes, wherever it was, saying they were too afraid to go out because they were getting calls saying, keep their heads low. It's not safe to go to the airport. What happens? Uh, the last soldier, American soldier, left Afghanistan. The Taliban had warned America to leave before September 11th. And well, American soldiers left before September 11th. And so the Taliban is now declaring victory in Afghanistan. Also, the Pentagon is confirming, as hundreds of Americans are left behind, the Pentagon is confirming particularly a particularly dangerous time ahead uh, after the withdrawal from Afghanistan. And so the Pentagon is saying that the country is going to be particularly dangerous going forward. And at the same time, U.S. officials have now confirmed that they shared lists of, of American names with the Taliban. And this is, again, raising some concerns about the hundreds of Americans still left in the country who either chose not to leave or uh, were not able to leave, uh, that U.S. officials had actually provided the Taliban with lists of Americans' names still in the country, we can assume. Now, on this note, it says here that amid sanctions, the Taliban is also expected to double down on drug trafficking. And this is going to be something really important to watch going forward when it comes to whether countries engage with the Taliban and which ones, which ones engage with the Taliban. Real quick, Florida girl, you're mentioning you saw an update on the dogs. Yeah, and they also abandoned uh, service dogs of our military and service members. They were left in their kennels. And, um, well, if they're still alive, the Taliban probably will not be very kind to them, uh, we would assume. Now, that said as well, the other big thing that's going to happen is drug trafficking with Afghanistan, especially as it engages with the Chinese Communist Party, and especially as it relates to whether or not the U.S. gives money to the Taliban, which they're saying may actually happen. Let me explain this. Now, it says here, amid sanctions, Taliban is expected to double down on drug trafficking. It says, as the world watches events in Afghanistan unfold, many have started to wonder what the Taliban rule means for the future of the country's opium production. Afghanistan is the world's largest producer of the opium poppy, which is the raw material for heroin, one of the world's deadliest drugs. The country accounted for nearly 83% of global opium production. Hear that, folks? 83% of, of opium around the world comes from Afghanistan between 2015 and 2020, according to estimates of the UN Office on Drugs and Crime, UNODC. And it's a key supplier for heroin markets also across Europe and Asia, meaning you may find some of these European and Asian countries continuing to buy their opium probably from the Taliban now. The U.S. military presence failed to curtail opium production throughout the Afghan countryside 
and mixed reports on whether they actually made an effort with that, which it didn't seem they really did. For two decades, opiate, the opiate economy, which, which includes cultivation of the poppy, processing it into heroin and trafficking, has been a major source of cash for Afghanistan. Despite its anti-heroin rhetoric, the Taliban has benefited greatly from this opium poppy economy and became the major player in the world's drug trade. And so essentially the Taliban, basically a drug cartel at this point going forward when it comes to their economy because they don't have a whole lot of other export products. In its first official press conference in Kabul, however, the Taliban pledged to end opium cultivation in Afghanistan in an effort to gain acceptance from the international community, but this comes with an important stipulation. So hear me out. The Taliban is saying in this first press conference that they're going to make an effort to get rid of their drug trade in opium. They're saying that they're pledging to end opium cultivation, but this is exactly what they said. They said, from now on, Afghanistan will be a narcotics-free country, but it needs international assistance. Hear that? In other words, the statement, Afghanistan is going to be a narcotics-free country, but it needs international assistance. This brings up an important point, which is this. Biden administration, another story here, won't rule out giving aid to Afghan Taliban. So folks, there's a possibility we may be giving money to the Taliban. Uh, we'll have to see how it goes. Again, they're not confirming they're going to be doing this, but this is one of the stipulations the Taliban has placed on whether or not they continue to become the world's largest producer of opium. And the other point, important point to note is what happens to the global opium trade if, well, the Taliban doesn't, doesn't produce it. When you have, again, they're the biggest producer, 85% of global opium coming from there. Well, probably it's going to come from the Chinese Communist Party and their fentanyl, uh, which is, again, synthetic opium, synthetic opium. But it's going to what's saying here about the possibility the U.S. is going to start giving money to the Taliban. It says here, President Joe Biden's national security advisor, Jake Sullivan, said it is possible. In other words, not yet happening, but they're leaving the door open for it, that the Biden administration would provide aid to the Taliban following the United States withdrawal from Afghanistan and the collapse of the Afghan government. And he told this to ABC News' Good Morning America on Tuesday. He said this regarding giving financial assistance to the Taliban and added, that will be about the Taliban's actions. It will be about whether they follow through on their commitments. Now, remember, Trump's willingness to have any engagement with the Taliban meant that the Taliban had to play by some kind of international standards, they couldn't overthrow, for example, the Afghan government under Karzai. They couldn't, for example, chase out the Afghan army, which they did. Uh, they couldn't do most of what they're doing now, like hanging people from helicopters captured from the United States. A lot of things the Taliban is doing would not have been able to happen if they wanted to have any kind of legitimacy or engagement. But now the Taliban controls the country. They can pretty much do as they'd like. And guess what, folks? The Chinese Communist Party now is looking like it's trying. It's going to try to act as the middleman between the United States and the Taliban, meaning that any kind of interaction with the Taliban as they become the new government of Afghanistan, any interaction with them needs to happen with somewhat of a somewhat to a degree of the approval from the Chinese Communist Party. And this says a lot about the the degree to which the CCP very likely preemptively negotiated with the Taliban. Because remember, prior to, the, prior to the withdrawal from the from Afghanistan, prior to the U.S. withdrawal, and prior to the Taliban taking over the country in 11 days, and prior to them doing so, riding around essentially in pickup trucks while the U.S. did not launch any attacks on them to stop it from happening, while the Chinese Communist Party had invited a delegation from the Taliban to China to speak with them about matters which, well, we don't fully know about. But it says here, this is just briefly, Beijing says, in other words, the Chinese Communist Party says, Sino-U.S. Co cooperation on Afghanistan, in other words, China and American cooperation in Afghanistan, is conditional on Washington's attitude towards China. So China now is, still has a diplomatic mission in Afghanistan. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken is saying the U.S. very likely will not have any kind of mission in Afghanistan after September 1st. 
uh, meaning that while well, China is going to have diplomatic ties with the Taliban going forward, and if the U.S. wants to work with China on that, well, it's all going to depend on the U.S. attitude towards China. <sighs> A lot to go into, folks. Uh, and as always as well, if you have questions, leave them in the chat. We'll try to get to them in just a bit. And it does help you for a question before your question, just so we can find them. Now, that said, another very interesting thing is happening, which is there's a new war on terror taking place. And this is a war on terror now, not against the Taliban. And I remember going back in history, 20 years, I remember, folks, that um, you, know, you had U.S. Special Forces operating in Afghanistan, Green Berets and such. Uh, who are, you know, the horse soldiers and so on, uh, fighting against the Taliban. After the September 11th attacks on the United States, resulting in the, well, the structure of the Twin Towers uh, buildings, you then had the U.S. launch a more complete war in Afghanistan and in, in, and in Iraq. And as part of that war, part of the reasoning behind it was going into Afghanistan, not countries that were directly involved, more likely in the attacks. Uh, was that the Taliban was working very closely with Al-Qaeda. And of course, you did have Osama bin Laden operating out of Pakistan. And keep in mind also that prior to the borders being drawn up between Pakistan and Afghanistan and a lot of those, a lot of those other countries, these were basically tribal regions that didn't necessarily recognize the borders they were placed under, meaning Pashtun tribal territory went between Pakistan and Afghanistan, and a lot of the Taliban fighters were doing the same. They were operating between both countries. Uh, the U.S. troops couldn't pass over into, uh, into Pakistan for the most part, uh, but again, you had, a, you had Bin Laden hiding out there. And yeah, Building 7 didn't kill itself from Jinx. Yeah, I don't think it did. Um, that said, folks, let's talk about what's happening with this new war on terror, because there's a lot happening with this. Um, Okay, so basically, we're getting pulled very likely into a new war on terrorism. The interesting thing with this is it's it's not necessarily it's not necessarily a war in any one specific country. This is a war against ISIS, and ISIS now has become a very decentralized terrorist ideology. It used to be again that ISIS, um, the Islamic State, right? Uh, that ISIS was able to operate across its own region that it held, where they basically took over I Iraq, Syria, a lot of parts of Iraq, a lot of Syria, a lot of other countries, and declared an Islamic caliphate. They had their own government. They were doing terrible, horrific crimes against humanity, as you all know. And the U.S. went in there and tried to, well, stop them from growing. And under the Trump administration, pretty much ended ended them, right? Ended ended ISIS for the most part at least ended the caliphate. Many of the ISIS fighters were thrown in prisons, and many of those ISIS fighters have now been freed from prison by the Taliban, thousands of them. Now, that said, we now have a resurgence of ISIS, and as there's a resurgence of ISIS, you now have a rekindling of the war on terror being launched not just by the U.S. and possibly very likely with airstrikes, including in Afghanistan, but interestingly, interestingly, very likely with other countries as well. So folks, the war on terror is back. Now it says here, one of the first countries to come forward, UK, the United Kingdom is, quote, ready to launch fresh airstrikes on ISIS in Afghanistan. And so this means we're staying engaged in Afghanistan as well, fighting ISIS, not the Taliban. And very likely, ironically, possibly working with the Taliban on this, and very likely, possibly as well, uh, giving some aid to the Taliban. We'll see. It says here, Britain is still able to operate in Afghanistan and will be ready to hit the ISIS terrorist group in that country, the head of the Royal, Royal Air Force has said. In an interview with the Telegraph, Air Chief Marshal Sir Michael Mike Wingston said, and what a name, Wingston for the Royal Air Force, he said, ultimately, what this boils down to is that we've got to be able to play a global role in the global coalition to defeat Daesh, ISIS. Whether it's strike or whether it's moving troops or equipment into a particular country at scale at a, and at speed. And he said, that if there's an opportunity for us to contribute, I am in no doubt that we will be ready to go. That will be anywhere, anywhere where violent extremism raises its head and is in direct or indirect threat to the UK and our allies. You hear that, folks? This isn't just Afghanistan. They're saying that will be anywhere where violent extremism 
not just terrorism, but violent extremism, as they're calling it, raises its head and is a direct threat either to the United Kingdom or to the allies of the United Kingdom, which is many countries. He said this and added, Afghanistan is probably one of the most inaccessible parts of the world, and we're able to operate there. And Britain's Foreign, Sec Foreign Secretary Dominic Reb also said that the UK stands united with coalition partners in their, quote, unwavering collective resolve to combat Daesh networks by all means available wherever they operate. Remember that Daesh was one of the names they made for ISIS. It was more the derogatory name. Uh, they called themselves originally just the Islamic State. Then they made ISIL, uh, Islamic State, and the Islamic Levant, and then ISIS. And so they, they went back and made all these different names. A lot of people did not want to call it ISIS because calling it the Islamic State, uh, people didn't think it should represent all of Islam, and so people called it Daesh as well. And so there's been a lot, a lot of different names for it. We still use ISIS because, well, that was the first major name they used, and it's hard to keep track if you keep changing it. Get this now. So the UK is talking about joining a new global coalition to launch airstrikes and attacks against ISIS wherever they may be. This does include in Afghanistan, where again, thousands of ISIS fighters were released from prison by the Taliban. The Taliban, which had been previously fighting ISIS, so it's very strange that the Taliban would release ISIS fighters in the country, who then launched terror attacks against the United States as the United States is trying to pull out of the country, killing 13 soldiers, or U.S. troops, and wounding several others, and killing uh, somewhere around 60 civilians. Then the Biden administration, as they had intelligence talking about the possibility of additional terrorist attacks from ISIS, launched airstrikes against these targets. And reports claimed, reports which have not yet been fully confirmed, I should note, because you can't fully take things at, at face value. Uh, there are claims on the ground that people who were actually hit by the U.S. airstrikes included like children, that they claim that they hit the wrong target. Uh, but as we know in the way these operations typically work, there's a lot of disinformation. And so it's possible as well that ISIS or local forces uh, just frankly lied about it to make the United States look bad, which does help uh, which does help to validate their own party and their own po their own political stance. Uh, but it's also possible that the US actually launched an airstrike and killed civilians instead of, instead of terrorists as well. Uh, that is currently being investigated, but frankly, their ability to investigate is going to be quite limited because, again, we just pulled out the last of our soldiers and the U.S. has no diplomatic engagement on the ground there currently. So in other words, they're saying they're trying to investigate it. There's no way we can investigate it. We're taking it basically at face value what the Taliban says at this point or ISIS says at this point. So take it for what it's worth. Now, this said as well, there's an interesting other development in this new war on ISIS, and it's that Pakistan is getting engaged. It says here, another story, Pakistan Counterterrorism Division. <laughs> Folks, Pakistan, one of the largest state sponsors of terrorism, their anti-terror division has killed 11 suspected ISIS members in a raid. And it says here, a Pakistani counter-terrorist division, CTD unit, killed 11 suspected members of the ISIS terrorist group on Monday during a special operation that erupted into an intense shootout in Bolakistan province. Remember that name, folks? Bolakistan? I'll explain that a bit more, because this is really important. That erupted an intense shootout in Bolakistan province, according to local authorities. The unit carried out the raid in the district of Mastung, where ISIS recently killed two police officers after obtaining intelligence reports related to a terrorist hideout in the region. Upon arrival, the police force immediately surrounded the compound after discovering that the hideout housed armed men, Don reported. Now, in other words, these were armed men, and they said they're suspected ISIS members in Balochistan. Now, folks, anyone know this is important? It's because in Balochistan, the terrorist groups functioning there are not ISIS per se. Technically, it could be anywhere. But you have separatists from Pakistan who've been a thorn in the side of the Chinese Communist Party. And the Chinese Communist Party has been trying to get the Afghan, the Pakistan government to fight them on its behalf because they're attacking the uh, shipping trucks of the Chinese Communist Party as part of the One Belt, One Road initiative. Long story short, China basically has a port in that area. 
And because it's technically a region that claims to be independent of Pakistan, you have separatist fighters deemed terrorists, and they, they are terrorists, frankly. They launch terrorist attacks, but not technically ISIS. And so they've launched counter-terrorist attacks, killing these separatist groups, possibly, or maybe legitimate ISIS fighters. And they're calling it counter-terrorism. Now, this is going to be the complicated thing we see going forward, because, again, the Chinese Communist Party is engaging both with the, well, both with the Taliban and with the Afghan government, fighting what they call terrorist cells. And the Taliban itself is talking about not allowing Afghanistan to fall in the hands of terrorists. They are a terrorist organization, uh, while also not allowing Afghanistan to become a staging ground for terrorist attacks, meaning who is the terrorist if the terrorists run the country? anybody who opposes the terrorists. In other words, counter-terrorism becomes terrorism, meaning very likely the Northern Alliance, which is the force that has been fighting the Taliban and the Mujahideen prior to them for a long time. And their sides have shifted during the Cold War. The Northern Alliance was aligned with the Soviets and Iran, uh, where the Mujahideen was aligned with the US. Mujahideen mostly became the Taliban and became against the US and heavily aligned with China, ironically, even though they were technically fighting against them, while the Northern Alliance became one of the main forces fighting alongside the US, meaning that these tribal groups don't really care about which country, you know, they don't care as much about international politics, frankly. Uh, their interest is more among these conflicts amongst themselves, and so you can go into this for quite a while. I won't go too deep into it, but the interesting thing now is that as the Chinese Communist Party is trying to gain say, footholds in both Afghanistan and in Pakistan, what are they doing? Well, they're very likely going to go after any forces that are deemed a threat both to the Chinese Communist Party's interests and to the local government interests, including the Pakistan government and the Afghan government. Uh, these, of course, are terror. Some of them are, in fact, terrorist groups. It's complicated in this region. But very likely what you're going to see going forward is the Chinese Communist Party exporting its model for dealing with these kinds of groups. Now, the important part when it comes to context on this is how the Chinese Communist Party deems terrorism. Terrorism, as the Chinese Communist Party defines it, you know, the, China, the CCP, terrorism as the Chinese Communist Party defines it is basically anything that opposes the ruling powers of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, you could be, for example, someone who just spreads pamphlets criticizing your local government and you could be considered a terrorist essentially under the Chinese Communist Party. They deem most of the Muslim Uyghurs terrorists. And as the Chinese Communist Party is carrying out actual, actual genocide uh, deemed as such by the United States and by other countries, they're calling it a war on terror. The Chinese Communist Party is calling a genocide a war on terror. And as you see them, uh, have been pushing for a long time for the Pakistan government to go after the Balochistan separatist groups because they've been challenging the Chinese Communist Party's own interests in that area. It would make sense if they just called that terrorism. And keep in mind that as you have now the resurgence of a decentralized terrorist organization, ISIS, the simple label of ISIS, even if the, even if the cells are not affiliated, affiliated with ISIS officially, is an easy way to justify moves against local groups that are just frankly opposing the interests of either the Chinese Communist Party or, or of the ruling regimes in those areas. Now, it's not to say these weren't ISIS fighters in Pakistan. It's possible they were. But this is one of the important plays on language that we need to start paying attention to going forward because the Chinese Communist Party is the one pulling a lot of strings now in both regions and in Iran, which is, again, the largest state sponsor of terrorism meaning, frankly, China's, the Chinese Communist Party is behind, frankly, a lot of these terrorist movements. Adding a bit more to that, we just discussed how, while well, ISIS, sorry, while the, while the Taliban is very likely going to re-engage in the opium trade, if the U.S. doesn't give money to them, if the Taliban gets rid of the opium trade, what happens? China, the largest exporter of fentanyl, synthetic heroin, synthetic opium, is frankly going to dominate the opium markets, and fentanyl is going to be the drug of choice for anyone who wants an opiate-like substance. At the same time, if they choose to continue to engage in the use, uh, to continue to engage in the use of well, opium and opium trade, the Chinese Communist Party has historically been deeply involved in that as well, going all the way back to the days of Mao Zedong. 
Uh, great book on this, Red Cocaine by Joseph Douglas, Mao Zedong called Opium, People's Heroin and People's Opium. And he modeled a war, a drug war against the United States using the model of the opium wars against China that had been waged by the, uh, that had been waged by the, um, sorry, uh, modeling it after the, the opium wars waged against the Chinese Communist Party by the British government. And so you're very likely going to watch this happen as well. Now, folks, that said, if you have questions, leave them in the chat. We'll try to get to in just a bit. Um, real quick, though, I mentioned we're still totally demonetized by YouTube. And so if you want to support this channel, we do have DonorBox. We also have Epoch TV. And Epoch TV is our uncensored video platform. We have a lot, we have a lot of great content there. Be sure to check it out. Uh, we have not just Crossroads there. We have our exclusive interviews there. We have uh, special features there. We have documentaries there. We have a lot of other shows there. Fantastic stuff. Check it out. I'll show you a quick trailer of what we're working on now. We have a few corporations, just really three of them, working together, controlling essentially all the social media market, the platform by which people exercise free speech, and then making it an effort deliberately to take away our free speech rights. Can we call tech censorship a violation of your First Amendment rights? Our free speech rights are unalienable. They cannot rightfully be taken away from us by government or by any other entity. So the First Amendment applies to government and says government can't do this, but no private entity can either. Tyranny is not just government tyranny. Tyranny is any kind of dominating structure that can take away your rights. As the enforcement arm of the government to impose upon our free speech rights, absolutely, not only is this now a free speech issue, but as you mentioned, this would now become a First Amendment issue. Folks, again, if you want to check it out, that's Epoch TV, E P O C H TV.com forward slash crossroads. Uh, we have a lot of great content there. Be sure to check it out. If you don't have an account yet, all you need for a free trial is your email address. So check it out. Uh, that said, let's go over some questions. So, first off, here is from Cameron Bacon. He said, Joshua, what's your perspective on how Trump is reacting throughout this entire dictatorship disaster that, the, that is the Biden puppet regime? looks to me like it's leading to an, an, an inevitable reinstatement of Trump as president. You're also asking, Josh, have you worked with Cash Patel? His show with Jan is great. This most recent episode was extremely enlightening regarding Afghanistan. Have you ever interviewed or worked with Dr. Jordan B. Peterson, particularly with this communist documentary? So let me get a few questions here. Um, first of all, what's my perspective on how Trump is reacting to the Biden administration? Trump's really not well, he's doing his rallies again, and he's basically playing the quiet. He's playing things a lot more quiet than I expected, frankly. Um, I think one of the big things Trump needs, if he's going to have a voice right now, is a, an internet platform of some kind. He does have his PAC, his political action committee, and he's challenging even the Republican establishment right now by basically overriding their Basically, the way you usually had it is the Republican National Committee, the RNC, would back candidates. Those candidates would become basically the ones representing the Republican Party. Trump is doing the same thing, but frankly, he has a lot more weight over the, in terms of getting people to, to vote than the RNC does. And so Trump has become kind of the behind-the-scenes behind the scenes guy pushing for the Republican Party. It seems to be the case, and he's, of course, doing his Trump rallies, and he's endorsing politicians for that. It seems to be the case that Trump's focus right now is more on the 2022 midterm elections. And his focus appears to be more not on becoming president again just yet. He's talking, he is talking about 2024, but because of legalities, he can't officially announce his campaign. Uh, but it seems to be the case that his main focus right now is overturning the House and the Senate under Republicans. And it does seem to be the case that because of redistricting, uh, again, the census, the census showed that major states like California and uh, and uh, New York, for example, they've lost so many people leaving the state that actually the number of house seats they get has been reduced, meaning those people leaving those states have gone to mainly red states. And so you're going to have less blue, blue seats. Uh, you're going to have less Democrat seats and more Republican seats, basically, meaning that the chance of Republicans taking the House in 2022 is actually very high. 
Um, and Trump is not just going for the House, he's also going for the Senate. And keep in mind, you have pretty much a tie right now, 50-50 uh, split basically in the Senate. And so that's also not difficult. Uh, it's going to be very close with the House and the Senate in 2022. Uh, we can see whether Trump runs for re-election. It does seem to be the case that he's positioning himself to do so. And we'll have to see as well, he's also going to need a social media platform again. He's been deplatformed off just about everything. There has been a lot of talk of him creating his own social media platform. We've only heard rumors of it so far, so we'll see what happens. Our uh, next question here is, have I worked with Cash Patel? You said a show with Jan is great. So yeah, we have a show on Epoch TV called Cash's Corner, uh, co-hosted by Jan Yakelik. Uh, Cash was, I, want to, I can't remember his exact title. He was one of the heads of defense under the Trump administration. Um, I have not personally worked with Cash, and I haven't had him on the show yet either, although speaking of which, I probably should soon. Um, but he, I know he did a show just recently talking about Trump's policy on the Afghan pullout because, of course, he was with the Trump administration and knew from the ground what was actually being worked on within the, within the Republican Party under Trump for that. And you're also asking, have I ever interviewed or worked with Dr. Jordan B. Peterson, uh, particularly with the communist documentary? I actually did one of, I actually did a really early interview with Jordan Peterson when he was first becoming popular. Um, I've been trying to interview him again since, but I haven't been able to. And of course, he's been having health issues because he got put on, uh, he got put on medication that he became addicted to, and it caused him a lot of pretty serious health problems, which he's still in the process of recovering from. I do have several interview requests out, out for him, but uh, he's not really as public as he used to be, other than his show. Um, if you do want to watch the interview I did with Jordan Peterson, it, okay, a it, bit of random trivia. It was actually one of the first video interviews I did. And basically we had, I did, it was a funny setup. I did the interview from our office in New York with Epic Times and we did it over Skype. And, and But the way we did it was we actually had our office in Canada send a camera crew to his house to do the interview. And so we had a camera crew at his house, but we were talking to each other over Skype. And so Jordan Peterson, he had a he had he had a uh, laptop on a chair in front of him, and the laptop was you know me on it talking to him. It was a very funny setup. <laughs> um, unfortunately, because that was one of the that was I I think one of the first two video interviews I did. One of the first ones I did. The other one was John McAfee actually. <laughs> think we ever will about John McAfee. Um, interesting character. He had some interesting ideas, but of course, very controversial figure. But anyways, back to Jordan Peterson. Because it was one of the first interviews I did, unfortunately, my question part, we were recording on our end, we had issues with it, and so you didn't get my question part. And so we only had his part. Um, that If you want to look up that series, it was a series of videos we did, but people took it and put them all together and posted them on YouTube, and it got way more views than I did, funny enough. But it was Jordan Peterson talking about postmodernism. And so the really in-depth interview he did about postmodernism was me doing the interview. And you can still find the interview online. It's the one in his, in his home where you, he has like the tribal mask in the background. It's one of the you know, it, we, did, we did it with really professional cameras, so it's like really good quality video. And one of the few like of that quality, you know it's mine because it has, uh, you'll know it's mine because it has the Epoch Times logo on it still. A lot of people reposted it. And also, so it has the Epoch Times logo, it's very high production quality, and it, it's filmed in his house. And so he has, again, his masks and stuff behind him. If you watch that interview, that's me interviewing him. Uh, but again, you don't have you don't have my audio part, unfortunately, because of some camera issues we had. <laughs> uh, and again, if you want to find that, that's Jordan Peterson on postmodernism, or you can try to look up Jordan Peterson postmodernism epoch times, and you'll you'll find that one. Another question here is from Christopher Scarpino. You said, "Will Ch the China Jihad Alliance now spread into adjoining countries such as Pakistan and Iran and into Turkey?" and even beyond. Will arms and fighters now flow from South Asia into the Middle East? So, important part on this. The Chinese Communist Party has been pulling strings behind the terror movement from the get-go, uh, including supply. And it, basically, they've even said this before, that uh, the Chinese Communist Party, that you know, part of their goal is to keep the U.S. busy in the Middle East. 
which does lead me to have a lot of mixed feelings about whether it's necessary for us to be in that region uh, because it's, well, especially because it's kind of an endless war, one, two, because you, it's an insurgency. And so actually the, you know, U.S. actions, they're causing more of an insurgency. At the same time, frankly, I would love to see freedom and, um, you know, frankly, a Republican form of government in many of these countries. And of course, I do know that we had a lot of, we had a lot of crossroads viewers in Afghanistan, apparently. I, I didn't know. I actually met one of the folks there who ran one of the big media and was telling me this, that they actually were broadcasting, not on our channel, but translating it and so on in Afghanistan. And so we had a lot of viewers there. And it's uh, really tragic what has happened. I know a lot of the Afghan people were really, um, really hopeful that they have a free country and we'll see what happens with it. Now, the unfortunate part, though, is that the CCP has been involved very heavily behind the scenes. Keep in mind, the Chinese Communist Party has been engaging with the Taliban going back to prior to before the 9-11 attacks back in 2001. They even built the phone line that Osama bin Laden was using. That was Chinese made. The, the, Ch the Chinese Communist Party and the Taliban had been working together for a very long time. Going back even further, the terrorist movement is deeply, deeply tied. Uh, to communist movements. Keep in mind that Vladimir Lenin, the guy who started the Soviet Union, uh, head of the Bolshevik Party, he and his brother were both terrorists. He and his brother were both terrorists. They ran one of the biggest terrorist groups operating uh, in that in well, Russian region. Uh, assassinations, you name it. Uh, when it comes to the global terrorist movement, a lot of that comes from the uh, they called it the Egyptian model of Islam, which was a merging of socialism with Sharia law that was under uh, Saeed Qutb, Q-U-T-B. And his main book was in the, uh, in the footsteps of the Quran. Uh, again, one of the main guys behind the founding of the Muslim Brotherhood, which was a reinterpretation of Islam implementing, implementing elements of socialism. And so this, a lot of this was really just the merging of socialism with a religion, uh, which led to Islamism, the religion. And they had, again, the, is, they had the Egyptian model of Islam, as they called it, operating under the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood. They were spreading a lot of this. The Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood was working more on the political side of it. You had a break-off faction that formed Al-Qaeda. And at the same time, the Chinese, sorry, the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union at the time, and Ceausescu under Romania, were financing the spread of different propaganda. They were spreading, uh, in addition to everything else, they were spreading the uh, the protocols of the elders of Zion throughout the Arab region, which was written off two previous books. The one previous to it was about the Jesuits, and the one previous to that was uh, about Machiavellianism. I believe it was called Meditations in Hell of Machiavelli or something like that. Long story short, the Chinese, the Soviet Union and mainly um, the communist regime under Ceausescu in Romania spread a lot of this stuff throughout that region. They wanted to set fires in this region. They also backed Yasser Arafat. Yasser Arafat was operating at basically their auspices. I won't get into the whole story of it, but these terrorist movements have always have always been tied to these communist movements. Uh, from the get-go, they were always tied to these communist movements. And so the CCP getting involved in that was just a natural outflow of it. And the Chinese Communist Party is still, as we speak, very much involved with this. Another question here from Cattle77. You said, is there any sort of war crimes that can be brought up against the military leaders and the president? Is it true the CIA met with the Taliban just before the two bomb attacks at Kabul? I have not personally heard about the CIA meeting with the Taliban before the attacks in Kabul. Um, they're claiming the attacks done in Kabul were, being, were done by ISIS, not the Taliban. It's hard to confirm any of this, frankly, because who's, who's the one validating, um, you know, confirming whether the guy who allegedly blew himself up was, a, was an ISIS fighter, not a Taliban fighter? Uh, you had ISIS groups come out and claim it was their guy, and they posted alleged photos of him. Basically, that's the basis of it. At this point, you can take it for what it's worth because there's so much chaos in the region and so much dis so much disinformation in the region that it's really hard to verify things, frankly. In terms of the CIA meeting with the Taliban, I have not heard reports of that. At the same time, it would not be unusual. 
because we don't have diplomatic ties there right now. And as the Taliban is taking over the country, you could expect the U.S. to make some attempts to engage with the Taliban. And we do know that the U.S. was engaging with them, at least communicating with them in some regards, although we don't know the full degree of it. Uh, because, again, we U.S. officials supplied the Taliban with lists of American names. Remember, we, we know we were communicating with them. U.S. officials did supply the Taliban with lists of American names, allegedly to help the Taliban in their alleged efforts to facilitate moving these Americans to the airport to be evacuated. That may turn into a kill list now, we'll have to see. Uh, but it's hard to say. Uh, so basically, I, I, I have not seen confirmation the CIA met with the Taliban. But we do know the U.S. was engaging with them, and it would not be unusual for them to have done so. At the same time, we did. the U.S. provided them with a list of American names, uh, which could seriously backfire. We'll have to see how that goes. In, in terms of whether war, war, war crimes can be brought up against military leaders and the president, you're probably not going to see it in the U.S. Um, you might actually see something like that attempted through the United Nations. Remember, there, were even, there, were, there was even talk of countries... You know, there were a lot of countries talking about bringing war crimes up against Bush and such. Any country can bring war crimes up. So it could happen. It could happen, frankly. Uh, would that be a good thing? Well, the Chinese, frankly, the Chinese Communist Party would probably love to prop that up, especially because we're going after the CCP for genocide against Muslim Uyghurs, Falun Gong practitioners, uh, ending democracy in Hong Kong, trying to attack. Uh, Taiwan, <laughs> the severe persecutions of uh, Tibetan Buddhists, severe persecutions of Inner Mongolians. It would serve the CCP's interest to try to, to try to draw comparisons between itself and the United States and make America look like it's you know a, a country that commits war crimes. It would serve their interest, and frankly, there are a lot of other countries that would be interested in doing that as well. And so it is possible, and frankly, there frankly there would be some grounds for it. I will have to see especially if the Taliban decides to align more, and this is going to be interesting, if the Taliban decides to align diplomatically more fully with the Chinese Communist Party and doesn't want to play both sides. In other words, they say, forget you, America, we're only going to work with China. They will very likely do this. I, I think the chances of that happening are actually very high. If they want to play both sides and say, get money from the, from the United States and you know, work with China, for example, on building critical infrastructure under its One Belt, One Road initiative and use them to put in put into place really tight social control systems, which they're going to do anyways. Uh, we'll have to see. It, it, could, it could go either way, but the chances of them bringing war crimes against the United States, even just for political reasons, is actually pretty high, I would say. But we'll see. We'll see how it plays out uh, because that, that would not win them many friends internationally as well. Uh, at the same time, maybe they don't care about that. Another question here is from Linda Battleborn. He said, Josh, did you hear about that Lieutenant Colonel Stuart uh, Skeller, the soldier who on Friday called out the generals for how the end of the war and because of 13 service members killed? Well, he quit the army after 17 years. I did see the reports of that. And so uh, I did. I watched his video. So there was this, this Lieutenant Colonel Stuart Scheller who made a public video, and it's actually very engaging, where he's basically saying, He's basically saying that if there is a mishap in a, in a U.S. combat engagement, if you have U.S. troops get sent out and something goes seriously wrong, someone's going to be held accountable for that. Someone is going to be held accountable, whether it's the squad leader, whether it's a soldier who misfired his weapon or made a dumb move, whether it's the uh, higher up officer who made a bad call, someone's going to be held accountable. And I believe he was the one, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe he was the one raising the issue. Well, what happens when it's higher ups? What happens when it's the people higher up in the chain of command who make really, really bad moves and lead to people getting killed and lead to possible human rights crises as we're now watching? Well, typically nothing happens there. And so he's saying that it shouldn't be, there shouldn't be an exception to this. Uh, briefly on this, if you read about traditional governance and traditional military doctrine. Um, for example, if you read the seven classics, if you read the seven military classics of ancient China, which are actually really good, a lot of people know Sun Tzu, the art of war. A lot of people don't, don't know the other ones that are really good. In fact, I have one back here. 
I, I, my bookshelf is further back now, so because of the new new camera setup. Seven Military Classics of Ancient China, highly recommended. My, one of my favorite books is the Six Secret Teachings of Tai Kung, and in it he talks about the idea that if you want to have really a functioning military, if you want to have a really good military, you need to demonstrate that the rules apply to everyone, that you can reward the lowest and punish the highest. In other words, if the lowest guy, you know, your private first class, you know, whatever, the, the guy who's, you know, fresh out of high school or something like that does something good, you still reward him just as you would reward an officer. He should be entitled to rewards if he does great things just like we have our medals and commemorations and so on, right? We have that. But he also said punishments should go to the highest levels. That if a commanding general makes a really dumb move and gets a lot of people killed or does something really stupid and gets a lot of people killed or something like that, that he should be punished in the same exact way as someone on the ground, as a, as a new recruit. He should face the same punishments regardless of rank. And by doing that, you can ensure that there's justice all the way through and people can recognize that the same rules apply to everybody. Uh, one of the famous stories of this uh, would be, um, ah, geez, I can't, remember the, I can't remember his name, uh, Yu Fei, I believe, in ancient China, who actually had his own son executed because his son was leading a, a military charge and stopped the whole charge and caused quite a disaster by doing so. He had his own son executed. And, and of course, it's quite harsh, but keep in mind, this is like way ancient China. But it was taken as an example of good uh, good governance, of good leadership, because he demonstrated the same laws, the same rules that would apply to the lowest also apply to the highest, including his own son. That again, you know, if, if the son of a politician breaks the law, the son of the politician should go to jail just like any other citizen. That, that's essentially the principle. Um. All right, it's getting a bit late, folks. I want to I want to go over a couple more points before the show ends tonight. So we'll, we'll end questions there, but there's a couple points I want to talk about because there's actually some really important things happening right now. And I'll make it brief because we are running out of time. But real briefly, as this war in Afghanistan is starting, ironically now against ISIS and amidst all this, you now have North Korea getting re-engaged as well. And this is happening as well as China's talking about invading, invading Taiwan. And China's talking, China, the Chinese Communist Party is talking about the need to get America engaged in four separate wars, as I've been discussing for a long time prior to any of this taking place. They were saying that if America were to attack Taiwan, they would first need to get America involved in four wars because the CCP wouldn't be able to deal with just America by itself, right? They would need to have other distractions. They would need, you know, keep in mind, the American, okay, I, I want to go, I'll go into a bit of history. The American military is designed to be able to fight two wars at once. Um, you know, we're a country with really two vulnerabilities, the East Coast and the West Coast. We have the ability to fight two separate wars. In World War II, this was seen fantastically, where uh, we had the army, uh, you know, the, the army fighting in the uh, European front, and we had the Marines fighting on the Pacific front, fighting the Japanese. Uh, we still have that system where the American military is designed to fight two wars. And so hypothetically, we could fight we could fight the war on terror and we could fight against the Chinese Communist Party, hypothetically. And maybe even a third one if it came down to it, because if you're dealing with technological technological differences, let's say, you know, the Taliban is not on par militarily with the United States, uh, we could probably take on even a third one. The Chinese Communist Party assessed that if there were to be a war with China and the United States, you would need to have America involved in four different wars to make it doable, to make it to make them able to succeed. Now, as we see things going forward now, uh, we do see signs of this happening. The individual was calling for this was one of the heads of one is one of the main think tank guys in China, one of the main advisors to uh, Xi Jinping, the head of the Chinese Communist Party. And he was saying, again, they had to get America involved in four wars. And what have we seen since then? Well, we've seen the Taliban take over Afghanistan after having diplomatic engagement with China, where they actually sent delegates to China to engage with them. Now, suddenly, they released thousands of ISIS fighters from the prisons. The Taliban did that. 
And now ISIS is resurging, and now the whole world is talking about fighting ISIS. Well, not the whole world, but a lot of countries, including the United States. That's one war. Russia is talking about invading Ukraine. Again, two wars. The Chinese Communist Party has been talking about attacking, has been talking for all about attacking uh, Taiwan. Three wars. And they recently put back into place their ADIZ, uh, which is their air defense zone, which going back to 2013, I believe, um, briefly, when the Chinese Communist Party declared ownership over the South China Sea, they said that ships going through and aircraft going through had to alert the CCP first and get permission. They've reinstituted that now. And so they're getting more hostile in that area that does include Taiwan. Three wars. What's the fourth war? Well, folks, North Korea. And here we go. It says here, North Korea appears to have restarted nuclear reactor, UN Atomic Watchdog says. And it says here, North Korea appears to have revamped a nuclear reactor used to, used to produce fuel for nuclear weapons, according to a UN atomic watchdog based in Vienna, Austria. The International Atomic Energy Agency, IAEA, said in its annual report that there have been indications of operation of, operation of a 5 megawatt nuclear reactor at the Yongbyon Experimental Nuclear Power Plant. It says, quote, including the discharge of cooling water since early July 2021. It deemed the obser observation deeply troubling. Now, this nuclear plant, which North Korea calls the heart of its nuclear program and research, is, suspe is suspected to produce materials that could potentially be used in the country's nuclear weapons development. Now, briefly on this. The Chinese Communist Party basically keeps the North Korean regime alive. If it were not for the Chinese Communist Party, they'd probably starve, they'd go bankrupt, they would not last. Uh, the CCP also provides a lot of their nuclear weapons uh, technology and helps deeply with their programs, as does Russia to some extent, and as does Iran to some extent, but mainly the Chinese Communist Party. The Chinese Communist Party was also kind of frenemies with Russia. I think, I think actually Russia probably would have broken away from that had they had the choice, which is why personally, this is my opinion and my analysis, uh, but my opinion why a lot of people did not want Trump to engage diplomatically with Russia because Russia would have taken the opportunity, I believe, to break away from that. And at the same time, um, the Chinese Communist Party engages very heavily with Iran, one of its largest international supporters. And Iran is one of the, well, the largest state sponsor of terrorism and actually has a lot of influence throughout Latin America, including in the drug trade, including in uh, terror, uh, narco-terror operations as well. And so you do have essentially four conflicts starting, plus uh, you have four conflicts starting, plus Iran coming back on the scene, which tends to play more of a subversive role in helping with terrorist operations, which will very likely play both in Afghanistan and in Pakistan. All right, folks, that said, a lot to go into as always, and uh, always more topics than we have time for. Uh, that, but of course, I'll always try to cover the biggest stories that we can get to. Always a lot going on, always a lot to talk about, and always a pleasure talking with you all here. That said, folks, every Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday, I do these live Q&As, so please tune in next time. Always a pleasure. And also, if you want to support Crossroads, please check out Epoch TV. That's E-P-O-C-H-TV.com forward slash crossroads. You can go to epochtv.com, but if you do the forward slash crossroads, it helps this channel more. So put the forward slash crossroads on there. Um, also with that, and that's just if you sign up, you know. Also with that, we have a lot of exclusive content there, our special features. We do have this new uh, Dark hit, dark Origins of Communism series I think you very much like. We have the recent documentary I did, a smaller special feature I did, on the American Constitution called America Rewritten. There's some other stuff in the works, which we'll keep you updated on soon. We also have a lot of other channels there. We're trying to get movies. We have a few movies there now you can check out. We're trying to get some big ones coming as well soon. And we also have some great shows for you to check out. A lot of great stuff. If you want to support us, again, check out Epoch TV. If you want to go the extra mile, please tell a friend or family member about Epoch TV. That said, folks, as always, appreciate you all. That said, please take care of yourselves, stay informed, and stay free. Thank you.